it's a real pleasure for me to have Peter Ryan here with me today. Peter is actually director of the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute for African Ornithology, and his key research interest is in seabird conservation. So welcome, Peter. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. So in the past week, we've been talking about the Anthropocene and about uh, many animals that are under threat. And we're wondering, what uh, threats do birds face today? I think birds face sort of the same kind of threats as all other organisms on the planet. So in a terrestrial sense, um, we're seeing habitat loss, uh, habitat degradation, pollution, invasive species, all the usual things with an overlay of climate change on top of that, um, making problems particularly for, for terrestrial birds. Once you move into the marine environment, it's a little bit different because it's harder to degrade the habitat in the same way. Um, but we are seeing uh, significant impacts through fishing. Um, and, and so marine species face an, uh, their own special set of problems. I mean, seabirds as a, as a group um, are, are really important indicators because 70% of the planet is covered in ocean. And it's quite hard for us as terrestrial organisms to really understand what's going on in the ocean. Uh, and, and we rely quite heavily on the sea for food for, uh, in the form of fisheries. Um, but it's, it's often very hard to actually understand what's going on even with those fish stocks that we exploit. And this is where seabirds and seals are really useful because they live in that environment, they have to find all their food in that environment, yeah. but they're obliged to come back to land to breed. And so we can get a window into the oceanic environment by looking at these animals during their terrestrial phase when they have to come back to breed. And so we know an awful lot about the biology of seabirds, uh, we know a lot about their conservation status, we can accurately count them, which is something you can't do for most marine organisms. And so we can see which species are doing okay and which ones unfortunately are not. Um, and certainly over the last 20 years or so, seabirds have suffered um, quite serious declines in many populations. Uh, and, and so up until about five years ago, seabirds were the, the group of birds that their conservation status had decreased or you know, become worse um, at a faster rate than any other type of organism or, or any other type of bird. Okay. Um, so that, that's really worrying and uh, the reason why seabirds are at such uh, risk is because they face threats in multiple environments. They're a little bit like migrants. Um, generally speaking, migrants don't do very well because they rely on multiple habitats, somewhere where they breed, somewhere where they winter, yes. somewhere where they stop over uh, on, on their migration. And seabirds are a bit like that. They have to have safe breeding areas and they have to have safe uh, feeding areas. Yes. And we have to conserve both of those. Uh, and and they, they face unique threats in, in both of those environments. So we work uh, quite a bit with the islands where they breed, um, where the biggest problems mainly these days are to do with invasive species. Mm. So uh, formerly we had problems with cats. We managed to get rid of the cats on, on one of the islands we work on. Uh, and, and now we have problems with mice and, you know, we get rid oh, of goodness, one, yeah. one predator and another one yes, raises surfaces, its head. Yeah. So that's, that's the sort of terrestrial side of things. And then we have issues at sea, mainly related to fisheries. Um, historically, seabirds were caught for food uh, directly by people, and, mm. and that was obviously quite a significant problem. Um, these days, most seabird populations are protected, but they still get killed accidentally on fishing gear. And so we work quite a lot with fisheries to try to make their activities more sustainable and, and uh, sort of limit the numbers of birds being killed. Mm. And is this across the board, seabirds in general, or are there particular species that are being affected? It, it varies from species to species um, very much. So the ones that breed on oceanic islands tend to be the ones that are most susceptible to introduce predators, just because, uh, like any oceanic island organism, they, they've evolved in the absence of terrestrial predators. And yes. when we introduce rats and cats and mice and mongoose and all sorts of strange things. They just have no answer to those uh, mm. sort of more advanced predators, if you like. And then in terms of um, the, the at-sea risks, the, there's sort of two types of fisheries interactions. One is the accidental mortality issue, and there it's quite easy to engage with fishers because generally they have a vested interest in making their fishery more sustainable yes. and they're quite happy to engage. More problematic is where f seabirds and the fishery compete for the same resource, mm. which is a problem that we have more locally in South Africa with the Benguela system, where we've got things like African penguins and Cape gannets and Cape cormorants all wanting to eat sardines and anchovies, which are also the target of a very large and fairly lucrative fishery. And so there you've got a head-to-head -head conflict between fisheries mm. and seabirds, and that's much more tricky to resolve. Um, and uh, yes. 
So, so do you have some kind of um, ways in which you mitigate this? Do you have meetings with fisheries? or uh, What's the kind of way in which you engage with the public? Mainly through government uh, structures in terms of engaging with the fishery. So the, there's a, a formal government process that sets quotas um, and the conservationists interact with the fishing companies through this government process to try to come up with a, a system. So South African law is actually quite good. We have yeah. this uh, ecosystem approach to fisheries enshrined in our national legislation, yeah. which says that we have to conserve not only for our sustained use of the resource, yeah. but also for uh, a sustained sort of ecosystem uh, out there in the environment and birds and seals are part of that ecosystem. And so we have to leave enough fish in the sea for them as well. Um, so that's enshrined in the legislation, but of course, Does between the legislation, the <laughs> yes, trying to actually implement yes. that is, is always a challenge. Uh, and so there has been some fairly rigorous debate, shall we say, over the last few years as to how best to manage this with you know, people with very differing views as to how best we should manage our fish stocks. And you know, people actually arguing that perhaps the reason why African penguins have halved in numbers over the last 10 years is not because um, there's not enough fish for them, that it's other problems, but of course those other problems haven't been identified. So it, it's, uh, it's a quite a charged environment. Mm, well, it's tricky, but at least I think there's some um, ways in which we know what to do. I mean, the, the, the idea is there, it's just a question of implementation. Yeah, the nice thing about working on birds as well is that they are quite iconic, people get engaged, mm -hmm. and so we have quite a lot of public support, and that really helps us to get leverage with the industry to actually do something about yeah. conserving them. And b before we finish, I just want to ask you one more question. And, you know, I've seen some terrible pictures of uh, birds affected by plastics in the water. And, I mean, surely there's something that ordinary people, you know, people on the street, anyone can do. I mean, what, what do you suggest? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one, a, a subject very close to my heart. Uh, I, I started my research career as a master's student looking at plastic ingestion by yeah. seabirds. Um, and certainly the amount of plastic in the sea these days is it's quite frightening. The, the sea becomes sort of the, the dumping ground for all of our persistent wastes. And plastics do live for a long time in the environment. And because they're light, they travel very well. So you can't go anywhere on the planet now and not find plastic. It's yeah. under the Arctic ice shelf. It's, you know, on the most remote island, you'll just find lots of plastic litter. Um, and South Africa has a real problem in this regard. Um, most of our solid waste, more than half of our solid waste, doesn't go into a formal disposal stream. Uh, and so it goes out into the environment and there it gets blown and washed down into the sea. Um, so really we, we need to work a, as a community to make sure that our you know, plastic waste plastics do go into some form of either landfill or recycling, ideally. Uh, you know, there's amazing technology now. You can make fuel from waste plastics. You can produce energy in the form of electricity from waste plastics. There's lots of ways. It's, it's a, just a matter of incentivizing it so that people will actually benefit from not throwing their plastic out into the environment. Exactly. I think we need to get that message across. But thank you very much for coming to join us. It's been such a pleasure having you here. And I'm sure we've all learned a lot about seabird conservation. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks.